The Yukon is a cold and unforgiving land, littered mostly by sprawling forests and rolling plains. Nature is queen out here, and she rules this land with a graceful iron fist. Those who test her rarely live to tell the tale, and I'm afraid that proverb is becoming truer by the day. For the better part of the last decade, I've been a park ranger at Tombstone Territorial Park. It's a massive nature reserve sprawling over 2,100 square kilometers. The land boasts a wide array of environments with thick forests, rolling fields, icy lakes, glaciers, and geysers, which allow for some magnificent views and unique experiences. It's truly beautiful, breathtaking, and I don't think I would trade it for anything else. However, something truly bizarre is going on out here, and I've been forced to rethink everything. I've never been much of a writer myself, so forgive me if parts of this are not the most vernacularly pleasing. Truth is, I figured I had to write it, because the media sure as heck ain't gonna cover it. What's happening out here is something I believe everyone deserves to know. It started about two weeks ago, when a late night visitor caught me and a fellow ranger, Gunny, just as we were about to head out for the evening. We use call signs for all the rangers out here, so I'll just refer to them by that to protect their real identities. Gunny and I had just locked up the main office cabin, when the sounds of a screeching engine emerged in the distance. A second or two later, and we see headlights emerge down the trail. It was a ski doo and it was coming up fast. Within moments, he was nearing our cabin. I almost thought the person wasn't going to stop at all. When he suddenly squeezed the handbrake and caused the vehicle to skid several yards and come to a stop underneath one of the exterior floodlights. His orange pleated jacket was torn up and helmet cracked. He killed the engine and I saw his wide eyes beneath his visor. He then basically flopped off the vehicle, hitting the ground with a thud before jumping back to his feet. He tore the helmet from his head using just his right arm, while his left dangled freely at his side as if it was injured. The man met our confused stare with a wide-eyed, clearly frantic stare. In a muttering, frantic tone, he managed to convey to us what had happened. He said he and his buddy were on a camping trip, and they had been out there for three days. He said they were attacked in their camp, and his friend was badly injured, and might already be dead. We tried calming him down, and asking him what had happened, but the man just kept shaking his head and begging us to go save his friend. We ushered him inside, and two of the other rangers began tending to his injuries, as Gunny and I mounted up. We grabbed our rifles from the lodge, and got on our ski to go find the wounded hunter's friend. The area the man had indicated was a solid 20 minute ride out, just outside the park's recreational trails, in a well-known area which was popular with hunters. Gunny and I took off riding, feeling the cold air dig into our splotches of exposed skin like little needles. We were never able to get a description from the man of what it was that attacked him. I imagined it was a bear, a pack of wolves or a moose which are all fairly common out here. Attacks from wildlife are relatively rare out here, but they do happen. Something about the event had left a deep pit of dread in my stomach though, and it persisted throughout the entire ride out to the location. Several minutes later, Gunny rounded a corner ahead of me and slowed. I followed behind and the headlights from my rig shone on a campsite off to the right side of the trail. He and I parked, and I saw the remnants of a tent swaying gently in the breeze. Debris was littered all over the camp, and most of their gear had been smashed or torn to shreds. It looked like a combination of a tornado, and Freddy Krueger had ransacked the site. Gunny and I cradled our rifles as we searched the camp. The night was eerily quiet, filled only by a random gust of wind that rustled the trees. After only a minute or two, we found the missing man, and he was not nearly as lucky as his partner. 
he was sprawled out in the remnants of his tent, face pale and body covered in red. His chest had been absolutely gutted, leaving fragments of internal organs scattered throughout the area. I felt bile rise in my throat as I observed the morbid scene, and turned away to dry heave as Gunny got a closer look. I've seen my fair share of animal attacks and accidental deaths out here, but I've never seen something quite that extreme. Something that completely eviscerated the guy. Suddenly, I heard the crackling of branches coming from the tree line on the other side of the trail. I lifted my rifle and aimed towards it, shouting a command for whoever was there to show themselves. Part of me anticipated a person stepping out of the woods, but what actually emerged was far more curious. A quadrupled silhouette rose in the woods, sporting a decent set of antlers. It stepped out, revealing itself as a three-point juvenile deer, probably just a few years old. Normally, deer are rather skittish, but not this one. It just stared at me, and my heart lurched into my throat. Its antlers were bloodied, covered in strands of flesh and viscera, and its eyes appearing as obsidian pools devoid of tint. Gunny stepped beside me, both of us clutching our rifles at our chest. Time seemed to stand still then, as the three of us maintained that silent staring contest for several uncomfortable seconds. And then, without warning, it changed. Gunny and I fired multiple times, but the deer trudged downward, slamming into Gunny and knocking him back several feet. He fell on the ground with a groan, and the deer swiveled in my direction. I fired another round, which struck square in its torso. The deer wobbled on its feet for a moment as the 308 bullet tore through its heart, causing blood to spurt from inside and stain the snow. It collapsed in a heap a moment later. I rushed to Gunny and helped him to his feet. He had been gored in the shoulder and was bleeding, but thankfully it was mostly a glancing blow. The two of us stared down bewildered at the apparently bloodthirsty deer. It was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. Normally, the only time deer become aggressive like that is when they're cornered, which this one clearly wasn't. Not only had it killed the poor other hunter, but it had stuck around and tried attacking us as well. It was very unusual behavior for a deer to put it mildly. Gunny then pointed out its eyes and the mystery grew deeper. Its eyes were entirely black, like little pools of obsidian. Normally, deer's eyes are pretty dark anyways with amber or dark brown irises. Gunny shined the light on them, and we saw no trace of that whatsoever. We thought then that maybe the deer was sick, rabies or some other disease. Gunny joked that maybe it was the start of a zombie apocalypse but I didn't find it as funny as he did. With that notion in mind, the two of us fled, because if the creature was rabid, then Gunny needed medical assistance ASAP. We sped back to camp, and found EMTs on the scene as well as a police car when we got there. The other man was unconscious and strapped onto the gurney in the back of the ambulance. One of the EMTs began tending to Gunny, but luckily, it didn't appear as though he had been injured too badly. Rabies is spread normally through bodily fluid, and since Gunny had been struck by its antlers, contraction of the disease seemed unlikely. Regardless, Gunny was loaded into the ambulance as well, and the team drove off soon after. I stayed behind, and the sheriff shot me a peculiar glance. But he said his friend was still out there. You guys find him. I nodded and swallowed as I tried to devise a way to explain what we had seen. The sheriff's eyes grew wide as I explained what we had witnessed. Man, you're sure it was a deer? I nodded, both of us confused. The sheriff shot a forlorn glance into the distance and seemed to ponder the implications for a moment. You ever heard of anything like that happening? I asked and he scoffed. Not unless it was cornered or rabid. That is some seriously strange behavior. 
He met my stare once more. Man, you're sure the guy was dead? I nodded again, as there was a no doubt in my mind. The sheriff pondered the situation for a moment, and then sighed. Well, we better go find him before the critters do. The trail was too narrow to drive trucks down, so we loaned the sheriff and his three officers our ski dues to go have a look. Gunny was whisked away to the hospital, and I stayed behind to wait for the sheriff. It was well past midnight when headlights finally emerged on the trail. I exited the cabin and met with the sheriff and his team. All of them appeared exhausted and wore confused grimaces on their faces. The sheriff, too, looked perplexed. You guys find the camp? I asked. The sheriff nodded, but his confusion didn't diminish. We found it, but there ain't nobody out there. Made no sign of that buck you two shot either. That didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't know how to respond. They weren't breathing. The sheriff nodded and pulled out a smoke from his pocket. He sparked it up and took a deep inhale, allowing the smoke to pour from his gullet and spiral into the breeze. Something probably dragged him off. I'll get a search team together, but it'll have to wait till the morning. He tipped his cap, and he and his team departed. I left soon after, but I don't think anyone got a good night's sleep. The next morning, the sheriff kept his promise, and by 9am, he had amassed a search team consisting of five cops, six rangers including myself, and about two dozen volunteers from the town. The sheriff gave us all the rundown on the situation, and soon after we had entered the woods, scouring in grid formation. We did that until the sun went down, and never found anything. Just snowy vistas and silent woods with no trace of the hunter or the buck. Some of the search team, especially the guy's family, held out hope that he was still alive and just lost. I didn't have the heart to tell them the truth that he had no pulse, but I found no way of explaining how the corpses had just vanished from their camp. There are cougars, bears, wolves, and a few other smaller carnivores and scavengers in these woods, but none of them typically drag their food away, at least not too far. We searched their camp top to bottom, and found a trail in the snow where the unfortunate hunter had been dragged off. Something had dragged his body through the snow for about 50 meters, but the trail was a dead end. It just ended with several sets of animal tracks carrying on further into the woods, but no trace of the corpse. Some of the footsteps even appeared human, but we weren't able to confirm that. Nevertheless, that brought forth two very concerning possibilities. Either this was foul play, and someone else was out there that carried off the body, or the body carried off itself. The former explanation was the main theory, as the latter was obviously ridiculous. I've been on dozens of search and rescue missions out here, and it happens several times a year. Usually the person is found without incident, but every once in a while we do find a corpse. What is really strange is when you never find anything at all. We returned to camp as the night began to swallow the trees, feeling disheartened and exhausted. The missing hunter's family was obviously devastated by the lack of progress, as were the rest of us. The odds of anyone surviving these sub-zero woods for over 24 hours are slim, especially if they're injured. The sheriff took a head count when we got back, and before he even finished, I realized we were missing someone. One of these senior rangers, who goes by Eagle, was not accounted for. I tried radioing him, but got no response. Myself and three other rangers, Mazda, Penguin, and Whiskey, set off to locate him, already fearing the worst. Eagle is an expert on these woods if there ever was one, and he's been out here for over three decades. He basically wrote the handbook on search team etiquette and procedure, and leaving the group alone is probably number one on the list of things not to do. The woods were silent then appearing much more sinister than they had when the light illuminated them. 
The gnarled, leafless trees seemed to reach out for us with skeleton fingers. The hair stood on the back of my neck and froze every time a slight breeze rolled through. A sudden shot from behind caused me to turn back and gawk at an unusual sight. Mazda was on the ground rolling back and forth as something small appeared to be attacking him. Get it off! Get it off! Penguin rushed to Mazda's aid and grabbed a hold of the creature which had assaulted him. He then tossed it away, revealing it as a squirrel which quickly darted back into the woods. Mazda's coat was torn, but he wasn't hurt, thankfully. Penguin helped him up, and he tried catching his breath. You steal his acorns or something, Whiskey added with a chuckle, but Mazda was clearly rattled. Needless to say, squirrel attacks are not exactly common here, or anywhere as far as I know. The heck's going on over there? A fifth voice then called from the left, an outstepped eagle with a confused expression. Where you been? We were looking for you. Why'd you break off? I questioned him, somewhat annoyed by his neglect. I'm sorry, I thought I heard something. He didn't say anything more, and just walked right by me to head back to camp. The other rangers followed him, but something made me pause. Silence. The type of silence only found in a cold winter's night. It's something I know quite well, but that night was different, and as I stared out into the dark, murky trees, I could have sworn something was staring back. We all rendezvoused back at the cabin, and the sheriff stood in the center to speak. He basically just thanked everyone for coming out, and that the search would resume the following day. I gave Gunny a call on my ride home, and he seemed to be doing well, probably from the plethora of pain meds that were apparent in his third, unusually chipper tone. I told him that we still hadn't found either of those corpses, and that Mazda had been attacked by a squirrel. After he finally stopped laughing about that, he said something I found interesting. Dang, first the buck, now squirrels are attacking people. Someone must have really pissed off Mother Nature. Thankfully, his rabies test came back negative, and he just needed some time for these stitches to heal. He and I shared a few jokes, and I playfully told him to rest up so he could hurry back and gather firewood for the cabin. I didn't sleep well that night, and didn't manage it at all until about 1am. When I finally did fall asleep, I didn't get much rest. I don't remember the details, but I had some very intense dreams. I hesitate to use the word nightmare because it's kind of cliche to me, but I think that's the best word to describe it. Like I said, I don't remember the details, only me waking up in a frantic gasp and drenched in a cold sweat. It might have just been the stress of everything weighing on my subconscious, but the anxiety refused to subside. Since sleep didn't seem like an activity I was going to experience that night, I decided to just wake up early and head into work. I figured I could get a head start on everyone and hopefully find the missing hunter. It didn't really seem likely by that point, and as my headlights beamed into the parking lot of the cabin, I found I wasn't even the first one there that day. Eagle's beat-up Ford F-150 sat in the lot gathering snow. I pulled up beside it and stepped out into the frigid morning, shivering as a cold gust of wind caressed the back of my neck. Eagle wasn't in his truck, so I figured he must already be inside. I had hoped that he had the courtesy of putting on a fresh cup of coffee, but the cabin was still locked and unlit. After unlocking it, I stepped inside and called out for him, but I got no response. I then begrudgingly took on the duty of making coffee myself, since without it, I'm about as useful as a pair of lead underwear. As it began to simmer, I took a more extensive look around the cabin. I thought maybe Eagle had just fallen asleep in one of the offices, but I didn't find him anywhere. On a hunch, I checked the key cabinet and my heart sunk. One of these sets of keys was missing. After checking the shed, I realized that its counterpart, Skidoo, was also gone. I stared out down the trail, 
but heard and saw no sign of Eagle on the ski -doo. I couldn't imagine what possessed him to go out there alone, and it really left me in an uncomfortable spot. All I wanted was to sip my coffee and wait for the others, but I knew that I had to go find him. With an annoyed sigh, I washed out a thermos from the cupboard, filled it to the brim with coffee, and snagged another one of the keys. I fired the skidoo up, burnt the crap out of my lips, taking a sip of coffee, and hit the throttle. In just a few seconds, I was on the trail out to the hunting grounds, as it was the only place that I could figure Eagle would have gone. It's winter here now, and the sun doesn't rise until well past 9am. It was around 6 then, but the darkness still reigned supreme, with my only defense against it being the headlights on the ski -doo. Several minutes later, and I was about halfway to the search area when I saw something off to the left. The missing ski -doo sat alone by the edge of a small gully. I pulled up alongside it and killed the engine. Once more, the deafening silence consumed the environment. The ski -doo was covered in a thin layer of snow, so it must have been out there for a decent amount of time. For all I know, Eagle may have never even left the night before. I thought about calling out for him, but I didn't. That same unspoken, haunting feeling was permeating the environment. It felt like breaking the silence was a sin in and of itself. I'll be honest, everything in me was screaming to turn tail and run back to the cabin, but I just couldn't abandon Eagle. He could have been injured, and my conscience wouldn't let me leave. The snow crunched underneath my boots, sounding like shattering glass in contrast to the still night. I made it to the edge of the woods and tried appearing inside, but the canopy of trees refused to relent their secrets. Something then snapped in the woods, a twig or branch. It was a significant distance away, but it might as well have been a gunshot with how distinct it was. It's well known that bears and humans are the only creatures clumsy enough to snap twigs. I looked around, once again considering calling out, but didn't. Another snap, this time to the left in the trees ahead of me. I tried rationalizing that it had just been snow falling off a branch, but it didn't quell my nerves much. Suddenly, there was a raspy wail, a sound which sent shivers down my spine. It called out again and again with a few second intervals in between. After probably the fifth or sixth one, I recognized it as a fox. Dang things make some creepy noises, especially at night. And sure enough, a lone red fox popped out of the trees some 30 meters behind me. Its eyes locked right on me, and the two of us just stared at one another for a moment. Suddenly, it lifted its head and shrieked again, this time in a completely different tone. It was the weirdest sound, almost like an odd, raspy snarl. The fox then darted back into the trees and silence returned. It didn't seem that significant, but suddenly a feeling struck me, one which I doubt I'll ever find the exact words to convey. A series of powerful, almost painful goosebumps jutted forth all over my skin. The hairs on my neck stood up, and I felt my heart rate soar in my chest. There was a weird scent in the air, like copper and mildew, and it was terrifying. It was like some primal sense within me had reawakened, and set off alarm bells on every fear reaction my body had. I turned back down the trail ahead of me. The moon had split the somber clouds above and beamed an effervescent light down upon the glistening alabaster field. At the other end of the field was a blockade of pines, and within them, something stared back at me. It was a bipedal, obscured mostly by shadow, tall and gaunt, slender and menacing. It's hard for me to describe it beyond that, and believe me, I've tried. The thing looked almost human and it was a fair distance away, so I couldn't make out its full details, but its impact was immediate. The way my own body reacted, like I was biologically programmed to fear it as a feeling I just can't get over. Whatever it was, the thing was not human. 
We just stared at each other for a while, until slowly its left arm lifted. Its finger uncurled in a pointed motion towards me. I started to back away towards my skidoo, and the fox yelped behind me once more. I fired up the skidoo as the calls of crows and owls reverberated overhead. More animals emerged from the woods. Squirrels, rabbits, deer, fishers, rats, and others. Dozens of forest denizens, all converging on me. I didn't stick around to see what they intended to do, and full throttled the skidoo all the way back to the cabin as the forest came alive behind me. The sheriff and two of his guys were there when I arrived. They turned as I came speeding back into the lot, killing the engine and quickly unmounting. The three of them eyed me in confusion as I tried to catch my breath. The animals. There's something out there. I looked to the sheriff and his confusion seemed to increase. Slow down, son. What are you talking about? Through a mumbled stream of barely coherent gibberish, I finally managed to spit out the most important detail of what I was trying to convey. The eagle's gone. The sheriff's eyes widened. And, as if on cue, a familiar yowl pierced the night. I turned back and saw the same, or at least a similar looking fox staring at me from the trail. Its sockets were like two hollowed out shells, and the eyes within them so dark it's as if they were molded from the abyss itself. I stepped back but the others didn't seem to sense my apprehension. The sheriff just eyed the fox warily, and it returned the gesture back at him. More sounds then emerged, chirps, growls, wails, and others one by one. In seconds, they formed into a dizzying chorus. A myriad of woodland creatures began to emerge from the thicket, with eyes of pure obsidian and malice. The sheriff took a step back and pulled his pistol from the holster. The other cops did the same, as the blockade of creatures stalked closer and closer. Suddenly, there was a loud grunt and an enormous shadow came charging through the trees. Its hooves slammed into the ground, kicking dirt and snow aside, while gaining speed as its formidable antlers lowered like a battering ram. It was a bull moose, and before we could even retreat, it was on top of us. The sheriff lifted his pistol and fired several rounds, but it barely phased the enraged creature. A 9mm against a full-sized moose is a little more effective than spitting at it, and in seconds, the beast slammed into the sheriff, launching him several meters back. He slammed into the snow hard, groaning from the impact as the beast scraped its hooves along the ground, snorting. The other cops began to fire on it, and although the bullets weren't enough to kill it, they did succeed in causing it to retreat for a moment. I scrambled to the sheriff and he groaned in protest as I tried helping him to his feet. I got him back inside his SUV, and he handed me the keys. As I rounded the front of the vehicle, I saw a shadow leap onto one of the other cops. He screamed as a tomcat dug its claws and fangs into the nape of his neck. The other officer ran to his aid, but he was set upon by a horde of small creatures. Crows swept down, pecking at their faces, while rabbits, squirrels, and chipmunks nipped at their ankles. I was about to leave the truck and try to help, when a badger slammed onto the hood of the truck. Its voracious fangs and claws slashing at the windshield trying to reach me. Thuds emerged all around us as countless other animals attacked. There was only one thing I could do then. I hit the gas, and the truck roared into action, flinging chunks of snow out behind us. I saw animals tumble from the hall as we swerved away, the screams of other cops blaring like sirens in the night. The badger too finally tumbled from the hood as I skidded to the right. Go back, I'm not leaving them, the sheriff commanded, though in his broken state I knew he could do nothing to help. I was conflicted on fleeing or turning back to help, so nature stepped in and made the decision for me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a familiar silhouette emerge. The moose slammed a full force into the passenger side of the vehicle. The window splintered and frame crumpled on impact. The force was so immense that I felt the truck rock on its axles, 
and before I could react, it teetered over and collapsed on its side. My head slammed hard against the window and my vision grew fuzzy. In my momentary delirium, I saw the light beginning to grow on the horizon. A miasma of sounds swirled into my brain as I heard the other men scream in pain and desperation. A familiar snort then struck and I saw the bull moose stomp out in front of the broken SUV. I felt its gaze bear down upon me and its enormous rack poised to tear me to shreds. All of a sudden, there came this odd, whistling noise. It was like the sound of a harrowing winter breeze played through a clarinet. Strange, piercing, and otherworldly. The moose then lifted its head, as if alerted by the sound. It shot me one final, disdainful glance and then trotted away. I heard the sounds of the other animals fleeing as well and the pain-stricken groans of the other cops. I looked at my side and saw the sheriff, suspended in the seat above me. Luckily, one of us had remembered to wear their seatbelt. He was barely conscious and bleeding. I managed to orient myself towards the windshield, and after a series of kicks, I finally managed to kick it out. I crawled from the wreckage of the SUV on wobbly legs, still dazed and in disbelief of what I had just witnessed. One of the cops was standing by the other vehicles, clasping his chest with his right arm. His left arm had been torn clean off, and his face was scraped and scratched like crazy. I regrouped with him and found that as bad as his condition was, he was the lucky one. His fellow officer was laying a few meters away, his chest uttering labored breaths. His face looked like it had just been shoved into a blender, and his torso didn't fare much better. There was nothing we could do for him, and less than a minute later, he stopped breathing. The wounded cop then radioed for backup, as I attempted to rouse the unconscious sheriff. A few minutes later, and a cavalcade of cops, ambulances, and citizen vehicles rolled up on the grisly scene. They got the sheriff and the injured cop into an ambulance while the remainder of the crew stayed behind to try and make sense of the madness. That was almost a week ago now, and things have shown a little improvement. The sheriff and his fellow officer are still in the hospital with a combination of multiple broken bones, internal bleeding, and other injuries. They never found Eagle, nor the other hunter which began this whole fiasco. A day or two after the incident, and Tombstone Park was shut down until further notice. It's not been officially posted online or anywhere else, but if you go there, they'll refuse you access. Who they are exactly, I'm not sure, but they've taken full control of the matter now. Two days after the assault, I was recovering at home when I got a knock on my door. Two men and a woman, all dressed in identical black suits, greeted me and inquired if I would be willing to answer some questions. They refused to identify who they worked for, which made me turn them down initially. They swore that I was not in any legal trouble, and provided a document of that fact. They then leveled with me, and said that people are in danger and they could really use my help. So, I agreed and told them essentially everything I've written here today. I asked them what was going on and who they were, but they avoided the questions with some of their own. They didn't say a lot as I retold my tale, and left soon after as quickly as they had arrived. These last few days and multiple residents of the town have attested to hearing bouts of gunfire late at night. Before long, Humvees started arriving in the town, with armored trucks, helicopters, and even an Abrams tank. And clearly, they aren't taking any chances with whatever is out there. I managed to run into one of the agents for this mysterious enclave that had invaded our town the other night. He was hesitant to say anything, but after I bought him a few drinks, his tongue loosened up a little bit. I assumed they were Canadian government operatives, but he denied that, claiming instead that they were a private security detail known as Misnomer LLC. Essentially, mercenaries, but with some truly impressive equipment at their disposal. I asked him what the heck was going on out there, and he admitted things were not exactly under control. 
Apparently, three guys had died earlier that day, and the attacks only seemed to be growing. He said that larger animals had since joined in. Cougars, grizzlies, wolves, elk, polar bears, and others. He said one guy even claimed to have seen a Bengal tiger out there, but no one could confirm that. He also said that some of the creatures they encountered were like nothing anyone's ever seen, like things that weren't yet known to science. He said that some large hairy bipedal creature had smashed the skull of one of his guys the previous night. They didn't get a good look at it, but it was clearly much larger and faster than them. He also said that something had taken down one of their choppers, and no one had any idea what it was. I asked him what the heck they were dealing with, but he didn't seem to have an answer. He said as far as he could tell, the local wildlife had become infected with some disease, possibly a mutated strain of rabies or prions. He said the animals didn't act aggressive in the day and seemed to behave quite normally, but at night, it all broke loose. He too had seen their obsidian eyes and said they were all like that now. I don't think he's right about that. I don't think this is a disease at all. If it were, then surely Gunny and the other wounded officers would have contracted it as well. Maybe the disease lies dormant in a host for a while. Or maybe it hasn't yet made the leap to being capable of infecting humans. But I have another reason for thinking that, whatever this is, it isn't the result of some contagion. The way the animals behaved wasn't like they were sick. It was like they were determined and vengeful. The way the bull moose seemed to respond to that strange whistling sound and retreated with the others. It's like they're being commanded by something like soldiers in some forlorn army. Their attacks are premeditated, coordinated, and ruthlessly efficient, and it leads me to believe that something is organizing them to be that way. There's a group of First Nations people known as the Athapaskan. They have settled these lands for countless generations, long before Canada ever became a country. They have a legend about something known as the Kyriktai, roughly translated as the one who hates. I have a few Athapaskan friends and they've told me that this thing is a malicious spirit. No one knows where it comes from, what it wants or how to stop it. They say that several hundred years ago it slaughtered entire tribes near the region, corrupting animals to follow its will. They said that it could have easily killed the entire continent if it wanted to, but it eventually just stopped and faded away and into folklore. They still refuse to speak its name, fearful of catching its attention. The more they told me about it, the more I was reminded of that thing I saw in the woods. That has to be it. Every time I think of it, that familiar sense of intense dread becomes palpable in my gut. I just can't ignore the feeling that it gave me. I don't know if I believe in these superstitious stories. I don't know if that thing really is the curic tie or not. For all I know, it could be an alien, wendigo, or frickin' spaghetti monster that's causing all of this. I suppose it doesn't really matter what I think, because something out there killed one of our rangers and a good friend. Eagle deserved better than what he got. All the victims did. As for now, the situation has apparently quieted down in the last few days. The animals haven't launched another attack, and that could mean one of two things. Either this thing has finally been defeated, or it's preparing for a large-scale attack. Pray for us, and hope that the second theory is wrong.